Hi everyone, welcome to Life Edge, because life, well, just simply doesn't have to be mediocre. I am joined today by my good friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. Hey Susan, how are you? Good, it's great to be here with a great guest, and we'll we'll be all about adventures and exploring new worlds. Sounds fun, actually. Here we go. This show is sponsored by Relay Corporation. Digital learning development, media development, corporate video, management consulting, and more. Visit us at www.relate.com. Thanks. And we are back and in our center position of power. Susan, will you do the honor? Yes, we're thrilled to have uh, Spencer Stryker, who is here. History Adventures, uh, Book of Characters, World exploration i think i got the word the title wrong (laughs) but basically it's a world of characters and the opportunity for immersive learning for students who are totally involved in in studying from home or from wherever but they want to have the experience the experience of actually reliving and traveling in time and i'm just i'm so excited about that so i was delighted that spencer that you accepted the invitation so how did you get started? Sure, and I'm delighted that you guys had me. Thank you so much for having me. I love the professionalism of the show. It's really, really cool. Oh, thanks. Uh, and by the way, Spencer, for, for, for you guys watching, he's, it's 1 o'clock his time in the morning, so he's, he's making an effort to come here. We appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a nocturnal anyway. I'm a night owl, so it's... Fine. Okay. So how did you get started? Uh, basically, tell us a little bit about yourself, your um, degrees, and how and your original interests. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, my my degree, probably my the main degree here is the PhD, which I earned at University of Wisconsin Madison. And when I was there from 2009 to 2012, I had the opportunity to study with some of the leading games, video games, and learning scholars mm-hmm. in the world. Uh, Kurt Squire and Constance Steinkuhler and by proxy James Paul G, who uh, actually invented the, pretty much founded the field of games and learning. This famous book, I know What the Game. Yeah. You know his book. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, so that that was um, in a way a uh, really important kind of training ground for me in thinking about how digital media and learning uh, can synthesize and synergize in a way. Um, to make more meaningful learning experiences. So then I went out to that. I went out to Silicon Valley and I worked, uh, I became the founding creative director of a, of a startup called Galaxies. And we raised about $4 million to do a, um, a like a, a basically a, a educational game where the lead character is a space explorer on an intergalactic journey. And in the process, you're learning science or you're learning the next generation science standards. <clears throat> so going from that uh, PhD program to then getting that kind of really substantive experience uh, making the game in Silicon Valley, then I wanted to do the new thing uh, that was going to be my thing, which I, I in a way, I, for history is more my passion than science. And so then I uh, got to kind of do, I went back to academia, I got, went to work at American University in Dubai, and now I'm at Northwestern University in Qatar. And I was able to, as a professor, uh, launch what was essentially my baby, which was going to be, which became History Adventures. And the purpose of it, the whole kind of underlying idea, is to kind of use the next generation of mobile tech entertainment technologies like interactivity, animation, sound design, different what you sometimes called multimodality. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and kind of combining that with narrative, in other words, using stories of people from the past to try to bring the past to life, and then combining all that together into creating eventually this product, History Adventures Worlds of Characters, uh, which is, again, it's like basically a fully, it's like a mobile experience, interactive, animated, with sound and 3D, 
uh, narrative themed, character themed, and trying to basically, t you know, make make the experience of learning about history more engaging, more exciting, and pop off the page. That's actually a really cool idea because, yeah, I remember a lot of people in school always hated history, and I, I found it fascinating. But once you yeah. start looking at things that people have done animating history or at least bringing it more to life like uh, oh who was it um was it john cleese i think he put a lot of videos into like the crusades and he created a, a very dynamic version of the crusades that was historical but was also a movie if you will a series and it was really interesting and the history channel and others have done a lot of stuff like that which is bringing it to life and and there haven't been that many interactive things yet so this is right. what what i find really fascinating about what you're doing because i think if kids start going hey you know there's more to this than just reading out of a book and i don't get it and they start yeah. seeing characters or talking with characters that's that's pretty neat i think that yeah, one of the mean, first ones no i was actually he made me think of a number of things i wanted to talk about based on what he said but please uh, uh were you going to say something? Oh, no. I was just going to uh, give a little context to see how far you've gone from, say, Oregon Trail, the early, early uh, interactive computer-based um, history education. And so this has taken it five or six generations from that. Well, absolutely. Yeah, and I played Oregon Trail as a kid, and I was deeply impacted by that. And that was, I think, it was 19... Late 80s, early 90s, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, maybe it was the late 80s. Um, but that is a pioneering, incredibly powerful, even though now looking back, it's so simplistic. But it was, uh, it really worked. It made history feel alive for us as little kids. Uh, I, I never forgot uh, when there was a, there was a scenario, a, like a fail condition of the game you made a mistake at some point in your kind of st strategic resource allocation or whatever in the gameplay. And they would tell you, you and your whole family of, you know, Oregon Trail Party have all died of cholera. <laughs> and, and it, you know, as a kid, as like a 10-year-old kid, that was like shocking. I was like, what? I killed my family. <laughs> yeah. And, but, but that emotional impact of that good storytelling and the kind of surprise twist there and being a little bit more gritty and authentic to history um, made this deep impression on me. So, yeah, that's kind of at the core of what History Adventures is all about. And, and coming back to what, uh, <clears throat> to what Rick was talking about, yeah, I think narrativizing history allows you to have an emotional connection to history. Mm -hmm. And that emotional connection is, is, I think, one of the keys to making history not boring. Because there's nothing really actually intrinsically boring about history. Uh, but the no. formal way it's taught can be very boring. Well, Spencer, so, you're saying, you're saying yeah. something that is so key to learning on the whole and is so ignored by most. And that's the role of emotion. If you have no yeah. emotion, you have no recollection, no retention. Exactly. And exactly. And it's so sad. I mean, these are educators, many who come out and they don't talk about that. They, don't, they rarely mention emotion or, or the fact that that helps the brain remember things, whether it's a good, mm -hmm. a sad, a bad, a horrific, traumatic. You'll remember something that, that touched you emotionally. And, and I just, I'm just glad to hear you saying that because that makes such a big difference. And like you said, as a kid, you go through something like that and go, wow, and you still remember it. And, and yeah. that's the key. If you can retain stuff like that, I mean, think of the power of, of what that technology did. And even though it was simple, how it affected yeah. you even back then, and, and now the stuff you're doing, again, of, of bringing it to life, what, what a difference. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I think part of the emotional connection there is this concept of empathy or mm -hmm. situated kind of empathetic – projection in a way like seeing history as a series of of people in high stakes moments making decisions for which they don't know what the outcomes are going to be mm -hmm. and that's really what history is and that when it's at the most exciting 
it's these very difficult choices presented to people in extraordinary circumstances, just normal people trying to, you know, get through, let's say, the opium wars mm. or the American Revolution or the siege of Constantinople or, uh, or <coughs> the, the, the Belgian conquest of the Congo. I mean, these are epic, high drama events. Um, and so by bringing it back to the human experience, the emotional intensity and the, that that non-inevitability of having to make choices in the moment, uh, I think that's very important for, as you were saying, sort of uh, making making it basically a more impactful, stronger memory mm -hmm. impression of his. Well, right. And then I'm thinking of Gagne's conditions of learning. You create that condition of learning, and then that constant reinforcement through uh, not just in behaviorist, but also constructivist kind of world, because what I like about what you're doing, especially in these decision-making ideas, it's not completely set in stone and, and people are not forced to make certain decisions. They, they have to, they basically learn from each other and they can do bad things. They can do some sneaky things as right. well as good things. Yeah. And there's so much complexity to history. Um, and I, yeah, and coming back to what you're saying, the non, the non inevitability of things is really important because mm -hmm. what is it that makes history really boring? Um, and and J James G talks about this. He says the one thing that we know about textbooks is that they, that they don't work. He has this incredible statistic that he shows that basically they are make people dumber <laughs> or something like that. Um, and why is that? It's because in a way you've sucked all the uh, excitement <laughs> yeah. and drama and emotional energy out of history and you presented it as a series of facts and dates to be memorized and kings and queens uh, which is like the worst way probably to introduce students to history and, and, and so um, yeah. you know yeah, Spencer, so they, what's, what's yeah. funny is if you ever read Latin American history I was in Argentina for three years and I was reading these books on history going, I am so lost. There were tons of revolutions, counter-revolutions, counter-counter-revolutions, counter-counter-counter-revolutions, all at the same time. I go, wait a minute, yeah. who's, who's on first here? What are we doing? Wait a minute, this guy just killed that guy who killed the other guy who's about to kill this guy, but somehow got saved by the other guy who killed his friend. Oh, my gosh. And, and, it, wasn't, and it wasn't exciting either. It was confusing. So it's like... Right. How do you explain that in a way? And then later I did see actually a small video of something similar, and it made much more sense in the video because it was timing. And all of a sudden with the timing, things started making sense. Whereas when, you look, yeah, yeah. when you're reading the written word, it was hard to get your, your head around, wait a minute, is this happening? Oh, wait, that's happening. At this no, wait, that's happening. And, and you can't put yourself in that place correctly. And, and you're right. It, most of the history books just suck any engagement out of it. And so people go, I hate. Same with math. If you look at math, math is really interesting. But math books can kill you. <laughs> I think they've been known to kill people. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. Math can be really interesting taught correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and coming back to this idea of narrative, um, you know, basically... We know that stories are a way of making sense of complexity. It's a sense-making tool that's very important to humans in the way they think. This is why myths evolved mm -hmm. in oral cultures over, over centuries and over millennia. It's why, um, it's why even marketers, when they're trying to get a message across and get cut through all the complexity, they kind of try to tell a simple story. Mm -hmm. Like, be like Mike. Okay, and then all of a sudden, oh, okay, now it makes sense. The brand of Michael Jordan or whatever, or uh, in in the jur in journalism, the same thing. We know that a scintillating story is going to make a much stronger impression, be much clearer, um, and so that is also true. I think of history as an entry point. Is um, narrative can be used powerfully. I think as a sense making tool. Now, beyond that, once you have the student, I think, hooked on history and you've gotten past that barrier to entry where, we're, like we were saying, that they're, they find it boring because of the way it's being presented, once they're hooked on history, then they can do this deeper dive 
like a you know a professional historian would look at history and then go back and try to make sense of all of this complexity and these dates and these these in, these interrelated events as you were saying but if you introduce that first well then they're going to be like bored out of their minds it's not going to make any sense so th mm -hmm. that narrativization as a way to hook them and make an as a sense making tool before scaffolding into this uh you know uh, del delving into uh, the true, you know, higher levels of complexity, shall we say. Now, how, how well, are people... Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Susan. Okay, well, I'm thinking when you're talking about higher levels of complexity and a deeper dive, part of it might be being able to tease out who has the actual power, what the beliefs are, and how they influence, mm -hmm. basically a deconstructivist approach. And, yeah. and I was wondering how you actually do that, because that seems to be the, the big step that a lot of people can't seem to make. Mm. Well, yeah, that's one of the fun things with the project. <clears throat> so <clears throat> for the one we just made, Revolutions and Industrialization, we're looking at, we use the AP World History as the backbone, and then we went from there in terms of building the, the, the narrative structure and the curricular structure as like, you know, a combined kind of concept. And um, <clears throat> so we're looking at this period from 1750 to 1900, which is, you know, this amazingly complex 150 year period of history and we're trying to basically boil it down to saying this is the time of revolutions and industrialization which of course is an oversimplification but those are like going to be two of oh did we disconnect it disconnected what are, okay can you guys sorry yeah it just disconnected it it, it auto dialed you back okay good um, so yeah, you're, so you're basically you're saying who are the people in the world whose stories define the age? Who are the people yeah. whose life stories, in a way, are at the intersections uh, <laughs> geographically, culturally, intellectually? Who are really like it, you know in the most kind of defining moments of the age? And and that's really fun. So you're looking around to find these characters, you know. So we came up with. Um, you know, an Australian Aboriginal character who's there at Botany Bay when the Australians, when, when sorry, when the British convicts arrive. Hmm. And so you see this dramatic clash of, 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 of cultures and life ways. Uh, uh, another one would be uh, a character we call Fei Hong, who is, who's living through the Opium Wars, hmm. and he's seeing the opportunities of the Opium Wars to make wealth for his family, but he's also getting pulled into these big... Uh, geopolitical struggles, you know, in his own way, his, his own microcosm is reflecting this this massive uh, wor world event that's occurring, where the with the gunboat diplomacy and the mm -hmm. British essentially forcing open the the Chinese ports to trade, and um, you know, so all these characters that we're trying to find at the cornerstones of history for the new one that we're making, empires and interconnections which is the period from 1450 to 1750. We have some, also some really great fun characters. And, and the theme that we're looking at there of that age is the incredible, powerful expansion of the European countries around the world and their rise to power. And then how are people kind of responding and reacting to that? Hmm. And for example, we have the conquistador in modern day Peru and and you're seeing that incredible clash of life ways and cultures and essentially the conquest of, of the Americas uh, and the Colombian exchange. Yes, that's him, Luis Felipe Gutierrez. And our idea is, of course, that he's not a very successful guy. He's actually like a second, third wave conquistador. And he's read the stories of, of uh, Pizarro and of Cortez and he wants to be like them and he has and he's battling in a way in his interiority in his mind he's thinking he's he's on one hand he's it's greed it's personal greed for wealth for status but on the other hand he also is truly devout christian and so he also believes that he's spreading the word of god and bringing that with him um and so there's that complexity going on inside of him in his mind of the 15, like a 15, <laughs> mid 16th century Spanish conquistador mind. And then he promptly dies. So coming back to the Oregon, <laughs> the Oregon Trail story, 
we wanted to introduce that kind of authentic experience where, you know, for every Pizarro, there were a lot of people who were not Pizarro uh, who, who, who failed, who died. And so, because uh, that was a very dangerous thing to do in the mid 16th century to go into the jungles and mountains of, mm -hmm. of Peru trying to find wealth uh, and glory and everything. And he gets a tropical disease and he dies. And so, <laughs> yeah. so that's one character. And you have a lot of these. And so that's Does a couple of things. One is, yeah. Sorry? Does he get buried in the catacombs in Lima? Does he get buried in the catacombs of Lima? Does his bones get thrown in there? <laughs> That's an awesome idea. I wish I should add that to the story. We didn't think of that. That's a very good idea. <laughs> it's really it's creepy cool. place. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have this, we have a piece of artwork where, in fact, we have him sort of uh, he's being kind of abandoned by his by his uh, fellow conquistadors mm. because they know they can't go on with him, and so in a way they leave him with this big wooden cross to die by a tree, mm. and he's and he's kind wow, of like. No. The tragic scene is like that they're kind of leaving him for dead. And Speaking off. of, we have a lot of pictures that you sent us. Um, can we show some of those now? Absolutely, of course, yeah. And they're really quite interesting. That one that I'm talking about, I haven't actually released yet. This, uh, these, uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure endings, the two possible endings for the character of uh, Luis Felipe Gutierrez, the conquistador, we haven't actually released that art yet. Uh, so, so are you worried about preview. traumatizing your students? You think you might traumatize your students? It's like dying out, like being thrown out to die next to a cross. That's really, I mean, it's beautiful in terms of its symbolism, but it's like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's important too. I wanted to, from the, coming back to the narrative idea, so we want to situate the understanding of history in emotionally charged narrative ideas. However, we also don't want to make it, um, you know, a fairy tale thing where there's the happy ending and the bad ending, because that's not true to life either. So uh, another concept of the product is that the endings, the choice that you are confronting with is going to be kind of an unpredictable, difficult choke point for you. But also the outcomes as a result are also going to be sort of unpredictable and hopefully authentic uh, scenarios and there's never going to be like you ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after um, and so you know there is there's one ending where the conquistador actually survives and he does kind of uh, go back to Lima to sort of regroup but he's kind of lost his his nerve for, for doing this this work uh, and in the other one he dies so actually he only dies in one of the scenarios but to the point that to the idea that he should that the students will be traumatized I think, uh, you know, kids are used to a lot of mature media, whether it's, you know, movies or games or whatever. And so I think they can handle it. And I, I think it's important that, particularly for high school kids, and I, I think that's part of making history exciting, is understanding that, hey, these are high stakes and horrible things happen. And history is actually full of a lot of horrible, horrible things when you really delve yeah. into it. Well, also, you, you want to be honest about it, because I remember going to school as a kid and you learned one history and then you get into college and it's totally different. You go, wait a minute, everything changed because now you're getting a lot more research done. Now you're getting the truth of what's going on rather than just nice stories that weren't quite accurate. And it was just sort of interesting. I, I remember the, not shock, but just the, huh, that's sort of interesting. Boy, didn't history change in the last five years since, you know, I've, I've been going to high school, three years since I've been going to high school. Hmm. Yeah. And, and so I think that makes people wonder, why is it so different now? And it was so different then. And, mm -hmm. and so it does bring up the fact, well, why are we learning two or three different kinds of history rather than what actually happened? A lot of it has to do with, you know, the winners write history. And so right. you get a, a, a very microscopic view of reality. And then, of course, when you look at all the other people involved, well, it's very different. And, um, and you know, yeah. you're, you're talking about things that happened or could happen to different characters in history not just what happened or what right. you know the, the the good thing that happened which may not have even happened um so yeah i find that really interesting because it, it i think it primes people for more of the reality of what history is versus we don't want to talk about that part mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. History, as you said, uh, history is written by the victors. <clears throat> history is a series of stories and interpretations. And uh, that's another important idea. And we, we didn't quite get that with revolutions and industrialization, um, although we did, we tried to kind of triangulate perspectives. So in other mm -hmm. words, you have the kind of the overarching narrative of world history that's considered kind of a Eurocentric view of, mm -hmm. of, of the story of the last, <clears throat> let's say, 500 years or so, right. uh, the last thousand years. Um, but at the same time, there's a case to be made for looking at history from the other side, I mean, you know, from, and, and so we're trying in a sense, and we're going to hopefully get better at that in the, in the, in the new books in the, 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 the series, to triangulate perspectives to, in a way, problematize and add, uh, sometimes you might say, a contradiction. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have one narrative which is the narrative that we accept as the kind of, I don't want to say master, but the overarching Eurocentric narrative of world history, which is what AP endorses and everything. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're going to have a character who has an experience and a perspective on the history, which is different. There's a different uh, things that he prioritizes, he or she prioritizes, yeah. and a different uh, view of events. Uh, so yeah, I think history is basically a series of perspectives and yeah. narratives from different types, different perspectives. Well, it's like they say always, you know, one country's freedom fighter is another country's terrorist. Yeah, right. two, two very oh, interesting wow. perspectives. Well, and it's like the yeah. consequences of theology, like the, the poor conquistador, the consequences of buying into the dream. Like, mm. oops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And at the same time, it's like, but from his vantage point, what were his options too? So in a way you can, instead of seeing him as a villain, like in other words, nobody, we don't really have pure villains, but instead yeah. you have characters that are all kind of shades of gray. And the, on the other side of it, um, the Native Americans who, in a sense, are really being victimized uh, by the European expansion, we don't want to also portray them overly simplistically as just 100% uh, good people who are 100% victims, because that's not accurate either. Yeah. And so basically, you know, trying to understand that everyone's the hero of their own story. Mm -hmm. And you can make their perspective, you know, uh, they see the story from their perspective and see themselves as the protagonist. Well, that was so the old joke. Kind of, well, that, that was the old, it wasn't a joke, but the old stories of, you know, the noble savages. And so they were painted as, as extremely noble and this and that, where they were doing all sorts of nasty things to each other. So, so you know, again, perspective. It's, yeah, everybody's got a story, but the stories, like you said, have, have good and bad in them. There's, there's no such thing as the perfect story. Well, here's yeah. a question, too. Okay, so here's a question for you. Like, I really am fascinated by the idea of who wrote, rules the waves, rules the, the world. And there's a, a fascinating yeah. series of books by Frederick um, Marion, and he's, he's uh, actually was an, a retired admiral in the British Navy, and he was writing in like the 18, 18 teens, 1820s. And he has one mm -hmm. novel called Midshipman Easy. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't read that one. Have you read that one? Mm -hmm. No, no, I haven't. It should have been easy. I'll look for that. It, oh, it's really worth it because it's written, it's it's kind of like a candide because it's kind of innocent. And everything turns out well, but it's so grotesque. And you're reading it watching, what? They're doing this? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm taking I'm seeing that right here, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, yeah cause history is often inconvenient, I think. Um, mm. Because you know we, we're looking for a simplistic, easy solution. We, in the coming, humans are instinctively kind of. <clears throat> I think complexity is stressful, so we're looking for some, a simpler uh, explanation and having to deal with uh, contradictions. Um, and this complexity is is harder on the brain than uh, just kind of going with this more simplistic narrative. But that's another thing we want to teach students is that. Unfortunately, and scaffolding it though, to your point, uh, Rick, you don't want to throw them in the deep end right away so much, mm -hmm. but 
scaffolding their understanding of the complexity of history and the more different vantage points that there are of history. Yeah. Uh, and to your point about Peru, pre-Columbian Peru was incredibly violent. They had all mm. kinds of wars going on. And uh, one of the reasons <clears throat> it's been speculated that the Spanish were able to conquer Peru was because the people were so unhappy with Atahualpa, mm. who was their, who was their, the Inca emperor, and there was so much underlying division and unhappiness with his kind of uh, autocratic rule and oppression and whatnot, that they saw the Spanish as an opportunity possibly to uh, mm. overthrow him and they could see the opportunity there. <clears throat> it didn't work out that way for them, but they weren't, they weren't happy. Uh, there were a lot of people that were not happy, let's say that, with the way that the, the, the uh, autocratic rule was going in, in, in pre-Columbian Peru. And it's, a lot it's, of it's really interesting because in Latin America they tend to have a very kind of negative outlook on the future. They'll say they'll say things like um, uh, "solo se va a poner peor." It's only going to get worse. <laughs> it's just very <laughs> common sayings, and it's like, why are you guys so negative? Yeah, when I when I lived down there, I was like, well, you guys think negatively, and they're like, no, we don't. These are just realities. And I go, well, yeah, but you're causing a reality of negativity. You're not living it. It's it's just very interesting how, how they look at life as as a culture. It tends to be much more, oh, uh, you know, look at look at and go to Mexico. It's ah, yeah, yeah. It's always oh, it's so bad. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, that is that is interesting. Yeah, the French are also kind of notorious for <clears throat> pessimism. Yes, John Paul Sartre and mm-hmm. Albert Camus and that existentialist movement. And yep. I always think of them smoking cigarettes in these cafes and just kind of, uh, yeah. sort of contemplating death and, you know, having <laughs> wrinkles under their eyes and they yeah. haven't slept. And, uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a sort of uh, peace, you might say, um, in pessimism. Mm-hmm. In a way, it it's kind of can be comfortable to just resign yourself to yeah. the fact that everything... Everything sucks, and everything will inevitably get worse. Yeah. <laughs> there is a kind of comfort in that worldview, that sort of nihilistic worldview. Uh, it's, uh, in some ways, it's actually more, I think, challenging to be optimistic. Yes. Given but you, knowing. Oh, yeah. But you know what's funny about the French? They get the ultimate punishment. They live longer. <laughs> <laughs> But you yeah, think about exactly. it, even the, even the humor of Rabelais, et cetera, it's like, it's like so a grotesque. I mean, the best French humor is, is, is um, Rabelais and Gargantua searching for hmm. comfort. For mm-hmm. Which is not anything Gallows you want. humor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now, we are almost out of time. So, Spencer, tell us where people can... Get a hold of this, of these kind of stories and what you're doing. Is it available to the public? Is it only in school systems? How, how does it work? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say thank you so much for having me on, on the show. And I've oh, really enjoyed pleasure. your questions. It's been, this has been really fun. Um, <clears throat> the product, you can find it. It's actually available in 51 countries right now. Mm-hmm. It's on iBooks. And you can okay. get it. You can just go to historyadventures.co. Not dot com, dot co. co. We don't have that URL yet. So, uh, and from there, we have a link on the homepage that will take you to the iBooks link, and then you can uh, simply download it. It's actually free right now, uh, and we intend to keep it free. Uh, you know, given the situation around the world right now, I think yeah. we just we just think it's better to make the product available for free for an indefinite period of time. Yeah, that that's wonderful. And. Uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, <clears throat> so you can go to the historyventures.co and then you can go to the iBooks and you, uh, link and then you can download it on any Apple product mm-hmm. on an iPhone, iPad, or on a, you know, a, a Mac desktop or Mac uh, laptop. Uh, it's not yet available on Android or on the web, for example, but that's something we want to do. We're going to develop we're developing, in other words, porting it to these other platforms to make it even more available, accessible. Um, and then we have, you can go to his, you can go to facebook.com forward slash history adventures, and then you'll find our Facebook page, or, uh, we have Instagram, which is instagram.com forward slash history dot adventures. Um, 
and, and between all of those four resources, I think you can pretty much find it. A That's ton great. Of stuff about the problem. And, and we're putting that all. So look at the links below on the comments. They'll all be there. So if you want to download the stuff, take a look down there and and do so because it sounds great. I know I'm going to be downloading tonight probably. Oh, I, I love it. I, I just I'm so impressed. And, and one of my well, besides wanting to go to Mars, one of my uh, <laughs> when I think about time traveling. The, my nightmare is to get into one of the situations where I can't just get out of it, mm. <laughs> or, or, or yeah. no one understands me. <laughs> oh, I love yeah. They, I, that's one thing that uh, excites that I find it's behind my creative inspiration for the project is the idea of time travel or projecting yourself into different times and places around the mm -hmm. world throughout history. Uh, but yeah, as you say, then you'd want to be able to get out too. You don't yeah. want to get stuck there. <laughs> you need to have the convenience of getting out. Like for example, ancient Rome is incredibly exciting mm -hmm. for so many reasons, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that as a modern person, we would not like over the long term, probably poor yeah. sanitation, you know, uh, you know, people did, you didn't get to brush your teeth. You didn't get to take uh, people, People did baths, but they did them publicly together, and I was lucky enough to get to a bath, and um, you know, medical care, and all these different things. Uh, the food would not—you would not have that nearly as much variety of food, and so on. So, while as exciting and thrilling as it would be to be there for a while and be a fly on the wall and walk through it, you'd want to get back to 2020, I think. Yeah, yeah. Though, well, you know, they were one of the few countries that had vomitoriums. That's that was very advanced. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Well. Anyway, yeah. well, well, Spencer, it's been a pleasure. Good luck on everything you're doing because it sounds really fascinating. And and um, well, we'd love to have you back on maybe another year or so and tell us what you're up to now or even sooner. Uh, let us know what you're up to and what's coming up. We'd love to hear about it. That would be fantastic. And yeah, as you said, we're going to do the new product, Empires and Interconnections. And then after that, we're contemplating a product called... History Adventures, World of Characters, Global Pandemics. <laughs> and yeah. for the obvious oh, yeah. reason that, that is on everyone's mind right now. And yeah. our idea there is to have five characters throughout history dealing with global pandemics. Interesting. Dealing with the plague, the plague of ancient Athens, uh, the cholera pandemic in London, smallpox in the yeah. Americas, yep. huh. the Spanish flu. Yeah, that'd be interesting, actually. So they, yeah. Yeah, in that uh, um, story, the, the hero is the kind of doctor who's trying to deal with this. Mm. And again, doctors have different asymmetrical un, 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 you know, understandings of what's really happening throughout history. Yeah. And then the villains, the villains are going to be these, these viruses and, and mic, micro, microbial bacteria. Yeah. Those will be the villains of the story. That's pretty good. <laughs> but anyway, Spencer, That's again, a good. pleasure. And, and we look forward to seeing you again. And... And uh, we're going to download those books. I'm, I'm dying to see them now. It, it sounds really interesting. So, again, have a good one, everyone out there. We will see you next week. And, and again, thanks, Spencer. Thank you so much. I really oh, thank enjoyed you. it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. It's been really, really fun. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Then.